Wow, what a wonderful day it's been, and I just want to thank every speaker that's been up here. I, um, when I probably got too much credit in the beginning when they said that we were coming and they had asked me to come, but I just believed from the very beginning that we had something um, greater than just me standing up here and talking, and you've seen that in uh, Dr. Small. Give her a hand. She did a great job, didn't she? And... She probably doesn't want me to tell you all this, but Kelsey's my niece, and I'm very proud of her. Give Kelsey a hand. And then Pastor Danny, wow, what a word, huh? Hey, man, give him a hand. So I also want to say thank you to Lauren, who made all the wonderful logos and everything and graphic designer. It, I would have had to have done it. It would have been like stickmen and that kind of stuff. But um, she did it, so it is awesome. And someone we haven't mentioned yet that I'm going to introduce real quick. She doesn't have to stand. You probably know her. Doc- Dr. Darla Quadra is going to be leading the fa- – she's going to be facilitating the panel, which means that I probably won't get a question. She'll say he doesn't know, so she'll go to the next guy. Um, no, we know Darla <laughs> from way back, a couple years, three, four years ago, I think, that we met her, and we just love her and – we, we want you to know that she's special to us. So we, uh, we want to take the time now to, I want to take the time now to introduce my wife to you. I want to um, tell you that she is more than just a pastor's wife. She's a pastor. She's a good one. She's my co-pastor at Thrive Church and, uh, in Visalia, California. We were at the coast. God blessed us. And then he told us to go back to the valley, where it's hot like Nevada. I came here, and I was thankful to be in Visalia. I'm just telling you that right now. So anyway, my wife holds two masters. Um, she holds one in, she has an MBA in a human source a resource, or human resources. Um, what is it? I don't even know anymore. Strategic human resource. She's got so many degrees, I don't know what to do with her. And then, and then she also has a master's in psychology that she got, and she's a life coach. And she does a really good job at, at life coaching me. So, um, and, and that's, that's great. She is my life coach. <laughs> you, can, you can have her if you need her for anything for about an hour, but I need her for the rest of the time. Um, but I just want her to come and share with you a little bit. Um, this is something that I threw on her at the last minute. Well, not last minute. It was about three hours ago, so it wasn't that long ago. But I asked her, to, I asked her to come now and just greet you and talk with you a little bit about what's on her heart. Thank you. <clears throat> Test one, two. Well, good afternoon. Thank you so much. First of all, before I get started, I think each one of you should give yourself a round of applause. Mm-hmm. So let's do that. Let's take a moment to do that. It takes a lot. It takes a lot to come and to sit and to listen for several hours and process some of the things that you've processed. So kudos to you for doing that. Um, But as Dr. Small was sharing her introduction and as my husband just shared with you, he said, I want you to come up and, and share a little bit. And I thought, oh boy, there's a scripture in there somewhere about being ready in season and out of season. So I quickly threw threw some notes down, and um, I'm just gonna gonna share a little bit of my testimony, my story with you. But before I do that, again, as Dr. Small was sharing this morning and talking about her fur baby, Honey Bear, she was reminding me of three loves that I left at home, and I'd like to share them with you on the screen. (laughs) Those are my babies, those are my my, my safe space, the, the white one, the littlest one is the youngest, and she truly acts like the youngest. She's an eight-pound chapeau, and she is in charge of everybody, including him. <laughs> the black one is the next, um, the second to youngest. He is Roscoe. He is a dude. You, he gets a fresh haircut. He stares at himself in the mirror like, check me out. Like, I am cool. I am handsome. I am hot stuff. He does that. <laughs> <laughs> and then the oldest one, you can see him up there, your top right-hand corner kind of peeking out. He is the one at the bottom of the doggy pile. He's the oldest of his litter, and he is my, believe it or not, my anxious little guy. 
he has suffered trauma, believe it or not, <laughs> and he has an anxious personality, but he is, he is our baby and we love him. But those are our babies. Um, our kids are grown, they're moved out, they're starting to have kids of their own, and so these are the three we have at home that take care of us now. <laughs> but um, anyway, thank you for indulging me on that. But I would like to take just a small amount of time to share with you a little bit about my story, and I hope that something that I have to share with you just briefly this afternoon will, will resonate with you and give you some encouragement. I was fortunate enough my entire life to be born and raised in church. Does not mean that I was automatically saved, does not mean that I got a free pass to heaven, but I did have a family that had a foundation in Christ, and I'm so thankful for that. I still had to make my own choices and my own decision. I'm so glad that I made the choice to accept God into my life because he's been with me every step of the way, even times when I didn't realize it. You know, Mark and I often joke around that um, there's the poem out there called Footprints, and we have a little bit of a different translation from that as where you see the drag marks in the sand. That's where God was dragging me from when I was being a little bit stubborn. He has more drag marks than I do, oh. by the way. <laughs> Give me the mic. Done. <laughs> no, I'm not done. <laughs> but I did spend most of my, my teen years and my adult life in a traveling ministry with my family, and I recall towards the end, which I wasn't realizing at the time was the end of our, our time traveling together, we were attending a revival at what was now my father-in-law's church. He's still the pastor of Tillery Church of God, but he had um, Candy, I can't remember her last name, Marlena's sister. Yeah, I can't either. Uh, Marlena Cano, if you're familiar with Terry and Marlena, her sister from Indiana is... Um, She's a minister as well, and she was speaking at this particular revival, and we just happened to be visiting that night. And at the end of the service, she said, can I pray for you? And of course, absolutely, I'll always take your prayers. And through this prayer, God began speaking through her and began to tell me that you are strong enough for this. I've created you for this. You can do this. And I walked away from that wondering, oh boy, <laughs> what am I getting myself into? I thought... Okay, are we maybe getting a little bit deeper into ministry? Are you calling me into a different type of ministry? What's going on? Well, things kind of remain stagnant for about six months, maybe even a year, and then enters the sky back here. And we've known each other's families for years. Actually, my father bought his first very nice guitar from his father back in the 70s. Daddy and I have sang in Joe's church over the years, so we've known, our families have been familiar with one another, but life hadn't connected Mark and I until about 13 years ago-ish, uh, maybe 13 and a half. We ended up sitting on a board of directors together for a nonprofit organization for disenfranchised youth. He had his life, I had mine, we saw each other at the meetings, talked about meeting stuff, and then we moved on. Well, God began to shift things a little bit. Things were shifting in his life. Things were shifting in my life. And eventually, um, I won't bore you with all the details, but with that shift of, of major life happenings, and in, in some instances, some trauma that he may get into, um, God brought us together. And through the course of that, brought its own set of challenges. And I remember standing in my bathroom getting ready for work one morning, and I was talking to God, and I'm like, God, I can't do this. I am not that girl. I am not strong enough for this. Please, please help me to find a way out. I can't do this anymore. And it's like he hit me upside the head with a two-by-four, and the light bulb came on, and he said, you can. You are strong enough for this. I've created you for this. And I was like, OK. And so I just, I instantly, what a situation I was already praying about, I just got deeper into prayer and got deeper into God's word so he could help carry me through this. With some of those life challenges, I became a stepmom to four handsome young men who I love with all my heart, but there's challenges when you blend families together, right? And um, same thing, through, through some of those, those courses, God, I can't do this, I'm not strong enough for this. And again, came that two by four, 
in the back of my head. I think I have a dent back there with the number of times I've been hit. <laughs> but just every single occurrence that has come up where I felt like I can't do this. I can't do this by myself. He has reminded me, yes, you can, for I have called you for such a time as this. As life's challenges have changed and we stepped into church planning in Hanford several years ago and then transitioning out of Hanford and into a revitalization process in Grover Beach, you know, again, every step of the way, God has reminded me, I've been there for you. And through part of that process has been probably one of the most, and I'm going to try and do this without crying, I'm sorry, has been one of the most significant challenges that I've had to face yet. And that is to provide care for my mother who had experienced early onset Alzheimer's about 10 years ago. Thank you. On Thursday, on the 30th, she'll celebrate her 74th birthday. Lord willing, she makes it till then. She is, as hospice has her categorized at stage 7B. She's probably towards the end of stage 7B. There's a total of, you go up to stage F, most patients tend to be called home or, or whatever between stages B and C. It's been a challenge. It's been difficult, but God has been faithful. God has provided strength where I didn't think strength could exist. God has provided support where I didn't think support could exist. So I want to remind you of a verse. Deuteronomy 31, verse 8. In this verse, God tells us not to be afraid or to be discouraged, for he goes before us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. I fully believe that God uses his people to keep his promises. God blesses us with different talents and giftings so that we can be support to others. He uses those gifts that he has given us, his children, to provide support to one another. And that can look different to everyone depending upon your circumstances and who you may encounter. We have learned and discussed some things today that could potentially be a little bit heavy. But sometimes we may not need that intense level of support. Even in different phases of life, it's okay to be okay. And it's important that you catch that. It's okay to be okay to find support, to find encouragement. You have your family, you have your friends, you have your coworkers. You probably have a good support system in place. But sometimes having that outside perspective helps to change your point of view. It may help you get to that next level that you need to be pushed to. So just keep that in mind, that God is using someone he has gifted in the area of helps to step alongside you in your journey and to help you to navigate through that journey. So if you've taken anything away from what I've shared with you this afternoon, please keep Deuteronomy 31.8 close to your heart. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. So I would like to take a moment to introduce my husband to you. He has more degrees than I do, more degrees than anyone probably needs. And I will say he graduated with yet another one this morning. <laughs> And that was his second master's, and after that, I have strongly encouraged him to take a break, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so he holds a doctorate in ministry and counseling and trauma, an MA in clinical health, mental health counseling, and his most recent from today is discipleship and ministry leadership. His day job is a program supervisor for Balance Treatment Center. He holds an ordained bishop credential where he serves on the state council and also provides support to ministerial care and ministerial development and other duties as assigned by our state administrative bishop, which tend to be a lot. <laughs> so I'm honored to answer the call of God has placed upon my life to stand alongside him as he serves as the lead pastor of our church, Thrive Church in Visalia. But all of these wonderful accolades aside, 
thing I'm most proud of him for is his passion and his love for people and his desire to help and to support. So I know we're coming close to the end, and I know it's been a long day, but I encourage you, actually rather I challenge you, just to hang in there a little bit longer. Listen to what he has to say, because it's just going to tie everything together from Dr. Small to my beautiful niece, Kelsey, to Pastor Danny, and then now to my husband. I asked you to talk. I didn't say give my resume, but thank you. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, babe. I, I do appreciate everyone that's here today, and I appreciate you being um, willing to go through this process. So here's my, here's my task. My task today is to help you kind of feel maybe, but actually understand what it's like to go through a therapeutic process. I am an associate professional clinical counselor. Um, I work, she said, as a... As a uh, supervisor, but I'm a therapist for balanced treatment. We do IOP, intensive outpatient. We do PHP, partial hospitalization programs. So some people come to therapy. Think about this, six hours a day, PHP. Six hours a day. That's intensive. Then we have the intensive outpatient. It's three hours a day. And then there's individual. That's one hour, 50-minute hour anyway. So what I want to do is give you an idea of what that might look like. So you may get the behind the scenes, what we're doing as therapists, but I also want you to see what you could be going through when you're there. Because I think some people get tense and they get really nervous when you say, hey, maybe you should talk to somebody. I mean, you don't have to say the word therapist. You don't have to say that. You say, talk to somebody now, and they're like, I don't need to talk to anybody it's not that they don't want to, it's that they're nervous. You know, I have people that when they find out I'm a therapist, they say, what are you looking at me like that for? You know, I'm like, because <laughs> you have something on your mouth, I mean, use a napkin. But I, I just want you to get that feeling. And I, I really believe that there's some things that I put in my um, presentation today that they go along with everything that has been said. So I won't belabor it by going too much into it. But there's a different slant to it that, that I have that will go and kind of fit nicely, I think, with what Dr. Small, what Kelsey, and what Pastor Danny has said. I should say Pastor Kelsey because she's, she's a minister too. But, um, <laughs> nonetheless, um, I do want to share with you a little bit about my story as we get into this so you understand. She is correct. <laughs> I do have trauma. I went through trauma because my first wife left, and it was very difficult on me. I, I won't go through the details. I, I had a part play in that, like... She did, and it was hard. I was in ministry. I've been in ministry for 38 years, and uh, I started when I was 15, and I was called at 13, but started preaching at 15, had my first real assignment at 18, and I've been going ever since. It's been very difficult. In the, it was very difficult in that time frame in the early 2010 area for me to go through that. Well, one of the things I went through was having to move into a different house. So I was getting ready to move into this house. My friend, he called another friend that I didn't know and said, hey, this is what this guy's going through. And they said, they can, he can have the house. He can rent it. And he'll rent it for this. And it was an affordable cost at that time. I was still going to school. I didn't have a lot of money. Huh? 800 bucks. Yeah. Wow. Right? Now it, and it was a, a, a two-bedroom house and had a nice backyard, the whole thing, right? So I come into this house and... The day I go to move there, I've got my brother, his name's Johnny, that's Kelsey's dad, and we're there, and we're, I think my sister was there, other people were there, we were all moving in, and getting everything in there, and then at one point, my brother stops, and I'm going to try to say some of these things without crying, but he he brings me over, and he puts his, right at the threshold of the house, and he puts his arm around me, and he says, Shalom, this is a house of peace. For you and your boys. Fast forward. Two weeks later, all four of those crazy boys are going nuts. They're fighting and yelling and screaming and going crazy. So I come in with my greatest therapist voice I can have, and I said, Shalom. <laughs> this is a place of peace, right? It calmed them down. It worked, so... Word of God, right? Name of God, word of God, the whole thing. So we're doing this whole thing, and then here comes two weeks later, Justin, my eight-year-old at the time. He's the third born. He's he's, uh, the old man of the group. He he was an old man when he was born. (laughs) 
And Justin is sitting there screaming and yelling at me, and I'm ready to take him out and make a new one. You know what I mean? Like, I'm done with this one. And all of a sudden, he and I are yelling at each other. He's screaming at me. I'm getting ready to go to jail. The whole thing, right? And Jacob, my second born, comes in and goes, Shamu. telling you. <laughs> I'm telling you right now, I know what you're going through if you've been there. And, and, and when, I, when you raise your hand with all that was happening, I was raising my hand. I know what it is. Pastors go through stuff too. We are not different than you are. We're just called to be something um, different than maybe you're called. I'm called to be a pastor. My vocation is a therapist, and that's what I do. They complement one another. I, um, I recognize that life can be cruel. I recognize that. Life can be cruel. There are many plans that we make in our life that do not turn out the way that we plan. I know that. Childhood trauma, divorce, all types of emotional pain can paralyze the best of us. I recognize that. I think you recognize that. But let's face it. We have an enemy that wants to spiritually abort every ability that we have to thrive. Thrive is a verb that means if someone thrives, they do well. Everyone say, do well. That's it. Thrive, do well. To do well is also to be successful, healthy, strong. It is more than surviving. Survive is defined as to continue to live and, or exist, especially in spite of the danger or hardship. On the other hand, thrive means to prosper, be fortunate, or successful, to grow or develop vigorously, to flourish. But God's way for us to thrive is found in what Jesus said in John chapter 10, 10, which has already been read today, but I want to spend a little time with it. A thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I came that you may have life and you may have it more abundantly. See, the Lord wants us to thrive in our Christianity, in our life, in our, in our relationship with him. He wants us to thrive. And everything that Pastor Danny shared is that way underneath it all that we can thrive. Because we can't thrive unless we take those steps that he was talking about. We can't thrive. We just can't. The spiritual disciplines, if you ever want to read a book that's a good thing on spiritual disciplines, read Richard Foster's Celebrating the Disciplines. It's an excellent book. It's been revised as 2022, and it talks about all the spiritual disciplines, the inward disciplines, the outward disciplines. talks about the corporate disciplines. But the things are, we get to pray, worship, and, or I'm sorry, pray, study, and worship. That's where we go, and those are our disciplines. But they're solitude. There's simplifying, simplification, right? There's all sorts of different things that we could do that would allow us to find a time. So today we're going to talk a little bit about some of those things, some of those disciplines in a different way. We're going to talk about those things. Today, the, the objectives of this session is to discuss how the therapeutic alliance between a therapist and a client can provide support, healing, and growth. Number two, to identify various theoretical approaches used by ther therapists. Now, I'm going to share my theoretical approaches that I use. If you go to another therapist, they might use a different one. That doesn't mean it's bad because there's all sorts of different theoretical approaches, and it depends on the therapist. It depends on the client. It depends on how they want to, to work with that. But we're going to talk about those approaches, and we're going to talk uh, about um, that promote clients' ability to process through their emotional and or traumatic experiences. Number three, learn and practice some coping skills used to provide emotional regulation and stabilization. Number four, discuss how scripture can inform the therapeutic process through the promise of peace and thriving in an abundant life with Jesus. So what is therapy? If I ask everybody in here what therapy... Now, today I've watched you all raise your hand on a lot of things together. But I promise you, if I went around with a microphone and say, what is therapy? We'd have way different answers. Because everyone thinks different things about therapy. At its core, therapy was created to give people a safe place to express, to discuss matters which were close to their heart. Now, 
Freud has been given a lot of the credit for psycho or I mean uh, excuse me for for therapy and for psychology. Can I tell you that psychology came from the Bible? It's in Psalms, it's in Proverbs, it's in Song, Song of Solomon, it's in Job, it's in Lamentations. We see psychology there. That's where we see it. So Freud, God bless his heart, said some good things and some bad things. But the truth is, God knows who we are in our psyche because God made us. And that was something we learned in the body and the brain and the spirit today. We've learned about that. The reason that each person seeks therapy is different. Some may seek it to manage the emotional turmoil caused by a loss of a relationship or a loved one, while others wish to cope with the stress caused by the physical and mental ailments that they have. Dr. Kim Golding, and this is in your notes, a place where you can write these in. Hopefully you can see this next slide pretty well. But it says that, or she comes up with what's called the pyramid of need. And I'm using, believe it or not, the one for latency or for children on the screen. And it, it goes, if you look at the very bottom, you know, because you see the arrows moving up on the side of, of the pyramid, you see that the first one is feeling safe. This is a thera therapeutic need hierarchy. This is something that cre is, a, is a place when we go in to see a therapist. These are the kinds of things we kind of need to make it successful. Feeling safe or emotionally, I mean emotionally and physically feeling safe. Then we need to feel like we're developing that relationship, like we're building rapport, developing relationship. Then comfort and co-regulation. There has to be some regulation. I don't know about you all, but have you ever, if you've been to a therapist and you've watched their, them have any kind of countertransference, you can kind of see it sometimes. We try to hide it, but it happens from time to time. Because you may say something, we may go, in fact, my thing is, wow. That's my, that's my little tick. Because it, it doesn't surprise me. It surprises me the level of intensity sometimes that they're going through it. And it just makes me go, wow. That's a lot. But there's that co-regulation. Then there's that empathy and reflection. As I empathize with them or you today, my client, think of yourself as the client, not as a group. As I empathize with you, I'm also trying to reflect back what you're saying to me. I'm trying to reflect that. And then resilience and resources. What's the resiliency that's being built up in the client and what is happening so that they can make it through with the coping skills they have that they've learned and what's going on, but especially the resources. You've been given some really good resources today. And hopefully, before we're done, you'll get more resources, and some of them will be local in the area of, of Las Vegas so that you can use them if you need them. The final one at the top of the is to explore trauma. See, you notice how feeling safe and exploring trauma are still far away? Because just because you feel safe doesn't mean you're ready to talk about trauma. Trauma is something that sometimes we hold close to the vest. But you know who knows about your trauma? <laughs> Jesus. He knows about your trauma before you say what it is. He knew you would go through the trauma before you went through it. Can I share with you a couple of verses that I, I don't remember the references, but I know that you'll recognize them if you've been in church any time. First, and there are two of the verses that I use often in my ministry, is that the Bible says that he inhabits the praises of his people. That means he lives, he dwells, he abides in the praises of his people. So when we begin to praise, like some of the, our, our speakers have said, we begin to worship and praise and begin to spend time in the midst of our problem and our trials and our, and our, and our, our trauma. When we begin to do that and that thing, that verse about being content whoever, I can't remember now who, who read it, but I've seen what being content is. When we do that, God is in the midst of what we're going through. He was already, but Jude 21, or verse one, chapter 1, only one chapter, verse 21, is in the Living Bible says, always stay within the boundaries where God's love can reach you and bless you. Now, you probably know it as keep yourself in God's love. But it actually... It means always stay within the boundaries. That means that we want to make sure 
that we are in a relationship with the Lord that our heart, mind, soul, and body are in the boundaries because God focuses his love and his blessing where his will is for your life. And often we find ourselves in, in, in trauma, in problems, in situations because we've removed ourselves from the boundaries. And that trauma that we're talking about here is something that if we realize that he inhabits the praises of his people, then the Bible also says where the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is liberty. How, how many would love to be free from all the things that weigh us down every single day? Those are real, those are real um, things that happen in our life. I want to talk to you about some of the approaches. Here's my main approach that I take in counseling. It is the theocentric model. This is going to be very difficult for me to share with you because this is one of my mentors, Dr. Oliver McMahon. I've known him for 20 years or over 20 years. He was my mentor for the last 10 of those 20 years. And uh, he just passed away with cancer just within the last few months. One of the one of the things that sticks with me every day, last night I looked at this picture and had a hard time thinking about it, but he wrote a book called Spiritual Counseling. And in this book, he talks about his approach, his model that he created called Theocentric Counseling. And it's a God-centered approach to counseling that was proposed by Dr. McMahon. And, it's, and it is a, an approach that God is both the center and the guide for all that's involved in the counseling process. He's, he says that, therefore, although counselees recover through the means of awareness, and we talked about awareness, and empathy, we've talked about empathy, and so forth, recovery is centered in God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shoot straight with you right now, and I know that we're recording this, but I'm just going to be honest with you about it, and it's going to be forever memorialized. God is the one that can fix the problems in our life. That's why so many people that don't know him continue to go back and back and back and back through the same thing they go through over and over again. That's why they end up in counseling and therapy over the same issue over and over again. I'm not saying you wouldn't as a Christian, but I'm saying that God is in the midst of that. He's even in the midst of those that don't know him. Every time I sit down with someone, whether they're saved or not saved, I sit in my office because I, I work in a secular for-profit um, organization. I sit with people all the time. I sit with people who believe totally different than I believe. But I don't, I don't really care about that because this theocentric model allows me to know that the Holy Spirit is in the room with me right now. Whether I say Jesus, Holy Spirit, or God the Father. All I know is he's in the midst. In the midst of what they're going through. And the smile on my face, the tear that may come in my eye, the empathy that I feel in my heart, those things, I know the Holy Spirit's doing way more in that moment in their life than they could ever know at that moment and that I could ever know. So if you go to counseling, pray to the Lord, whether you go to a Christian counselor or not, pray to the Lord that the Holy Spirit would guide and direct your process in that moment. Some of the other things that I would talk about today would be CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy. This, the goal of, is, of this is to teach clients to identify changes or, and change dysfunctional thought patterns. Now, we've talked about it. I urge you, brothers and you, God mercy, that you present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God. This is your reasonable act of worship. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. Do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is to prove the good, the pleasing, and the perfect will of God. This is what CBT can do for you as the Holy Spirit uses that kind of cognitive behavioral therapy model and approach. So therapists, I use this often with some of what, when I first began, therapists using CBT teach clients new ways of behaving that will be more adaptive and lead better overall functioning. If you look at this next thing, you can see this, this area of CBT changing perceptions, and you see the thoughts at the top, the emotions on the on left, probably your right, and the behaviors on my right. The thoughts are what we think affects how we feel and how we act. The emotions are how we feel affects how we think and act. 
The behaviors are how, how, what we do affects how we think and act. And if you look at the, the arrows, they have, they have arrows on both ends, so they're moving around. It can, you can go back and forth depending on where you're at. I don't have a lot of time to go through all these approaches, so these are something maybe you can look up. There are things, CBT and DBT, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. CBT and DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy and cognitive behavioral therapy, these things, these, there's books in the store you can get for the layperson that will, is a workbook that will help you go through some of these things. And they're very good. If you want some of those names of those books, I can let you have them. The next um, thing is dialectical behavioral therapy, which you actually have to go through. I'm sending two of my therapists right now through this. You have to go through, a, we have to pay a lot of money, and you got to go through a lot of training. And Marsha Linehan is her name. She's the one that came up with this. And she goes through this, and the goal is to balance out your acceptance. Remember, Kelsey talked about this, the acceptance, with the change. DBT is hel helpful for those who may have behaviors interfering with their successful treatment. Working with clients expands their toolbox of coping skills that can help them, experience, or help them experience painful emotions that they may be avoiding so that they can address the problems of everyday life, including career and relationships, things like that. But really, DBT is one of those things where if you go to the next slide, it really deals with mindfulness. It deals with emotional regulation. It deals with distress tolerance. And it deals with interpersonal effectiveness. These four areas, I guarantee you that if I went around, if I, if I had the time, or if Kelsey and I had the time, because I, I need help, and we took two offices, and, and we took five clients today, and we took you in, and we started talking to you about this stuff, I guarantee you that your issues would fall into one of these four areas right here. Like, we could help you start to deal with some of the things that you're struggling with because of mindfulness. Mindfulness is the practice of being fully aware and present in this one moment. We've talked a lot about that, so I'm not spending a lot of time going back over and, and rehashing it. Emotional regulation is how to change emotions that you want to change. Distress tolerance is how to tolerate pain in difficult situations, not change it. And then interpersonal effectiveness. How do you ask for what you want and say no while maintaining self-respect and relationships with others. So boundaries. I bet you right now I said the word boundaries and relationships, and all of you started going, oh, I know someone that needs boundaries in my life. <laughs> and some of you went, look at the hand. You know, I mean, whatever it looks like, boundaries are boundaries. Because boundaries are one of the things that, you know what, Christian people are horrible with boundaries. I'm just telling you right now. Because we're all over the place. We'll, we'll hug and kiss and love and what's up. And we'll be all over in each other's space. And then when we find out, hey, did you know sister needs prayer? Let's pray for her because she's, you know, she's got this problem. And then we say the problem. Like confidentiality, I don't know where it is in the Bible, but I haven't found it just yet in the clause. <laughs> Maybe that's why we don't do it. But we're not the most confidential people on the planet. Look at this next slide. This is CBT in relationship to DBT. You've got the thoughts, the behaviors, the feelings. This is the cognitive behavioral therapy approach. Then you have the DBT. I just wanted to show you this because I wanted you to see how that you could use these together very well. Now, one area, the next one approach that I use is psychodynamic psychotherapy. This is what we use a lot in my practice that I'm at now. This is where... This form of therapy focuses on revealing the unconscious content. Now, don't get scared. Don't get nervous. Ooh, you know, it's all getting hairy for a minute. The client's psyche that is causing tension. This is similar to psychoanalysis as it involves looking at early experiences. Now, she talked about the degree that I graduated, that I actually got on to the graduation, did not have my regalia, and got off as soon as they said, you have to put your camera on. I was like, leave, you know. I got off real quick this morning. But it's discipleship and formation or discipleship and ministry leadership. That's what the degree is in. And what I've learned in that degree is that the formation, especially the spiritual, the Christian spiritual formation that we have, that God has, it began from the time we started breathing. God was already forming us. In fact, he said he formed us in our mother's womb. And he ordained us 
to whatever he ordained us to be. Each of us have a different purpose. He ordained us. So this is similar to these early experiences, internal conflicts, problems, interpersonal relationships, defense mechanisms. These things have formed, have been formed in our impressionable years, in the years we may have had childhood trauma. Maybe things have come up for us, but working through these core issues is the key to successful recovery from mental health and dual diagnosis struggles. If you know what dual diagnosis, that's a, a, a thing where you have substance abuse, substance use and abuse, and that's coupled uh, together with your mental health. Now, we're not a substance abuse place, but we deal with co-occurring disorders, which is what that is. And I'm telling you right now, if you, can get, if you take away all the substance, you still have all this left, the mental health. So if you're here today and you're struggling in addiction, if you're struggling in any of those things, can I tell you that you, you, you may have something, in fact, you, you probably do have something underneath pushing all that. Anger is a secondary emotion. Something else is underneath that, pushing it up. Something else is there. So what is content versus process? Content are the stories that, about what happened, and we share them with our therapists. You would share those stories with me. I would listen. But processing is accessing the client's internal experience and working through parts of it. Not the whole, but parts of it, because eventually you'll work through the whole. And we want to do that. So process, again, I'm just kind of fixing some of these. I'm, I'm kind of finishing up all the things that we've talked about today. We've talked about what it is to process through. Process through is to look at who we are internally and to look at why we're like that. And sometimes we don't know that until we go deeper and we talk about it. But here's the thing. If you were in my chair sitting in my office I would not be giving you advice. In fact, the art of giving non-advice is what we do. <laughs> That's what we do. If you go to a therapist and they have nothing but advice, say thank you so much and go somewhere else. You don't need their advice. You need their facilitation and ability to help you to find out what's going on inside of you. We're taught that in school, by the way. That's one of the biggest things that we're taught is that we're not to sit there and give that. Now, it may be different in pastoral counseling because we're going to use scripture. We're going to use different things. It's not quite the same as clinical counseling. But when we're in the, the, the counseling that we are involved in at times, we are giving you, as we hear what's going on, we're validating, but we're also giving you some coping skills, some things that you can do, some homework, if you will, that you can do that will help you Come to the realization of what you're going through. Because here's the thing. If I said, you know what it is? This is what's going on in your life. You're going to say, yeah. And then walk away and say, man, I can find 15 different reasons why he was wrong. But if you come to the realization that that's what's going on in your life, that's much more eye-opening, isn't it? It's much better for you. Much better for the process. I want to talk to you, and we only have about five more minutes. I want to talk to you about... Some, some skills. Now, I will move forward real quick. I'm going to pass the meditation slides and go to the coping skills where it says four by four by eight breathing. We're not going to do this now because you did it earlier. I was going to do it, but I don't feel like I have the time. And if we, if we have time during the, the resource time, we'll do it. But this, what you did with Dr. Smalls to, Small today was extremely important because that breathing technique you can do anywhere at any time. This is probably the most this is the go-to for most people when they're in, you know, when they're in the casino and they're waiting to go into the, um, to get into the restaurant like I was the other day trying to get through 15 people. I don't go into casinos often, but when I do, I panic. I don't know what the problem is, you know. And I'm trying to go in to, to get, I got lost the other night going into one of them. I'm like, oh, God, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in sin. I got to get out of here. <laughs> I got to get out of here. I'm in, the, I'm in the lotus. I'm never going to get out, you know. But this is something that will be very helpful. And, and Kelsey already touched on it. And I was going to touch on it for uh, another part of it. She mentioned to you about your belly, something that we teach as uh, I'm a vocal coach and I've taught people as they sing that you, do, you don't want to breathe like this, like this. It's all up here, tense. And by the way, this used to be up here when I was a football player. <laughs> But now it's down here. So no laughing at the pregnancy belly that I have. 
But if you're breathing, watch this. Here we go. Ready? See that? I can. See, the thing is, if you breathe like that, think about a baby sleeping on their back. They don't know how to breathe incorrectly yet. They just breathe. That was something I learned in my associate's degree from a very awesome mentor I had in social work. Taught, taught us that. He actually had us lay down and breathe. And when you lay down and breathe, you automatically have muscle memory from way back when. I'm almost 54. That's a lot of years ago, you know. But you start to breathe. I think that sometimes we forget that the tenseness and the stress and the tension we're talking about. We try, I talked to somebody the other day going through a panic attack. And I said, okay, listen, we're going to do this breathing. Okay, put your feet flat on the floor. Put your hands like this. Sit down and go like this with me. And I did the counting. And then I went. And he was going. <laughs> I'm like, no, we're not having a baby. Come on. We're careful now. No, but I mean, there was just no way he was going to get regulated in that moment like that. And so. Why, why do I bring that up? Because some of these things that we're talking about is sometimes we may need to find ourselves grounding ourselves in, in the, the, the present moment that we're in. And so I want to look at this next one. We haven't talked about this. It, it came up a little bit, but grounding techniques for the senses. This is a very common one, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. I hopefully you can see that pretty well. If you're in the room and if you want to... It, it, Again, I can't go through this right now because I really want to get to the meditation piece as we end. But what you do is you find five things you can see and really concentrate on those five things in the room. Or take a nature walk. Take a walk around the neighborhood and pick five things. I remember when I was working with adolescents, I work with latency, which is the kiddos, then I work with adolescents, and I work with adults. But I was with the adults one time. We were walking around, and I kept going, look at that grass. Is that fake grass? I think that is fake grass. Yeah, I think it is, Mark. What is that? Oh, look at that grass. That's dead grass. By the time we got done, because they didn't want to be a part of the process. By the time we got back down, they didn't know what I was doing. When we sat down, I said, okay, well, we're going to talk about grounding ourselves. How many of you notice how many times I ask you about the grass? Yeah, what was that all about? Yeah, how many know you stopped talking, thinking about your problems? Oh, man, they got so mad at me. I'm like, I'm going to have to bring a different person in here to take care of them now. They're in crisis because I helped them. I mean, I don't know what the problem is. But we just need to, to find five things that we can see, four things you can touch, three things you can hear, two things you can smell, one thing you can taste. You can use these things to help ground you back. I'm going to show you one other thing that I think blows everyone's mind half the time. I want you, you're all sitting down. I want you to close your eyes just for a minute so that you're not looking around. And I want you to feel your chair pressed up against your legs and bottom. Instantly, you just realize there's a chair under there. You knew it was there. But you didn't feel it until I said it. And part of that is because, you can look up, part of that is because we take for granted what's around us. But in that moment, you can actually feel the pressure of the chair. And I would have taken a lot more time to do that with you. But you can feel the pressure of the chair up against your bottom and up against your legs that you didn't know was there. I mean, we take for granted that we can feel the, the floor under our feet. But you can do so many of these things, and you can do them while you're in the grocery store when you're panicking. Or when you're at McDonald's, and they've taken five minutes to eat your Big Mac, and you're mad. I mean, come to me. We just need to pray you through, because you have patient issues. <laughs> so I want to go back to the slide that says meditation. This one, nothing big about this. I just found this on the web, so it's not like, don't read everything. Because you ain't going to get me to do yoga. It's not happening. Not that it's not good, but I can't get this body to bear to get down these stairs, let alone do yoga. So. Your what hurts? It said no downward dog. <laughs> downward dog, no. I don't even know what that is. Um, <clears throat> next slide says meditation on the word of God. This is what I'm going to leave you with. Because there's nothing more important than using the word of God in your life. His word, I, your word I've hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. He also says that, or he, it also says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. 
and the Word became flesh. There's nothing more important in your recovery process, in my opinion, than connecting to the Word of God. And those of you that have problems with tattoos, I'm sorry, but on my arm, my right hand arm, I have tattooed on there Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 8. Because that's my mental health verse. That's what took me through my trauma. It says, do not be anxious for anything. Oh, yeah? Really, God? Really, Paul? Yeah, really. You've heard from Dr. Small how she said he was in prison. He said, don't be anxious for nothing. But in everything. Now, here's the thing why I'm bringing it up, even though ever it's been read twice. Listen. You could read this in another version. It was said, don't be anxious. Turn your worries into prayers. Think about that. Everything that we've talked about today, taking it all and turning it into a prayer. We have a really good friend. We used to sing, my wife and I used to sing professionally and travel around. And, and we have a, a, a group that goes out, and her name's Diane Nita uh, Mummert. She sings the song, why, why Pray When I Can Worry. I mean, think about it. We do it all the time, right? We, I mean, why pray? We're going to worry anyway. Or flip it. Turn your worries into prayers. And stop letting the enemy have a seat at your table. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me lie down in green pastures. It says that he prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. Depression is your enemy. Anxiety is your enemy. PTSD is your enemy. Mental disorders are your enemy. They come at you and they're there because of what's going on in your life or has happened in your life and they come at you. But I can tell you that all we have to do is be anxious for nothing, turn our worries into prayers, make our requests known to him and the peace of God, that's, we love this verse, and the peace of God that passes all understanding. That's it? No. It will guard your heart and your mind, your emotions and your thoughts. CBT, DBT, right? It'll guard your heart and your mind. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, whatever, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, Think about these things. So would you do this as we close today? Would you close your eyes? And would you take two minutes? And I'm, I'm going to walk away and let Pastor Eric and Pastor Holly come. I'm, I'm going to leave you with this. Close your eyes for the next two minutes until you hear their voice again. I want you to meditate on the word I just read. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, whatever is worthy of praise, think about those things. Just think about that. If, in other words, count your blessings. How has God informed your blessings? Take that time.